Welcome back to DWeb Decoded, a podcast by Filecoin Foundation that explores the intersection of blockchain and the data economy. I'm your host, Aaron Stanley, and today I'm joined by Kai Warsnick, co-founder of Impossible Cloud. Kai, it's great to have you on the show. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks for having me. Great. So let's dive right into your background. You have a, a, a super interesting background, uh, a, a very, um, we'll say heterodox background, perhaps, when we're talking about the world of storage and uh, and, and deep in and compute and whatnot. Uh, so you have a doctorate in law. Your brother has a doctorate in orthodontics. Uh, but the two of you decided to team up and start a mobile gaming business uh, as your first business venture before you got into storage. So I'd love for you to tell us a bit about that adventure and then would love to talk about how you transitioned into uh, into storage. So, uh, but yeah, tell us, tell us a bit about your entrepreneurial background here. Yeah, thanks a lot. So I tried to keep it brief, but uh, obviously it's uh, quite of an uh, interesting journey and ride. So uh, during my very, very uh, uh, youth days, I was always excited about math, physics uh, and, and programming, actually. So um, I did lots of, of coding back in the days, uh, mostly like also some kind of hacking back in the days it was hard to get like around copy protection on, on gaming and so forth. Uh, so you need to know like some assembly and so forth. My brother was always better in playing the games and I was still on top of the high, high score lists uh, because I was uh, kind of hacking the code. And um, the other thing that was always inside me was kind of this entrepreneurial uh, uh, idea, like building something, founding something. I didn't know back then like what it was. Um, and in order to become an entrepreneur, I, I later, for whatever reason, decided then to study law because like whoever founded a company knows that you always get, uh, I don't know, these, uh, these traps, these, uh, these uh, things that you need to get around from a legal perspective. So I thought, okay, maybe it's a good idea to study law, um, but always with the intention to, to found a company. So I, I would consider myself kind of as the uh, probably a black swan in the, in the legal area there, or the lawyer area. Never practiced as a lawyer, uh, finished my studies, did my PhD there. And during my PhD time, I already had the time to join forces with my brother. Um, and that was the time where we started really iterating on many, many ideas. So basically, back in the days, we met also with a few other folks um, once a week over a beer or whatever, and then discussing ideas. And then, of course, the Internet was super hot, was super interesting. Lots of startups, lots of, lots of ideas in that area. And that got us completely hooked and excited. And then gaming was also a hot topic. We love to play games, uh, although I would say the driving force be behind like founding a gaming company was really the entrepreneurial idea. And uh, then we took it from there. And uh, I programmed the first game myself. It was an online poker game. Uh, my brother was doing some graphics. We had some uh, additional backend engineers and a front ender. Like I'm, I'm more on the backend side. Um, and then later, uh, fortunately enough, we hired a lot of engineers that were coding a lot better than myself. Uh, so I think I know the basic stuff, but uh, yeah, so that was good. And then the gaming company took off, really had super success in the peak times. So we were basically founding out of the uh, basement of my parents' house. Uh, in the peak times, we had like 1,300, 1,400 employees, um, more than a billion revenue just alone with the most successful single game title. And there were a lot of other game titles. So we started browser gaming, the mobile gaming, uh, lots of stuff. Um, and then in the end, we did a reverse merger to the NASDAQ, uh, basically reversed merged into a, a smaller holding uh, listed entity, became the major shareholders there. Then it was like three more years uh, in, in the... Uh, uh, board of the listed entity. We did lots of M&A, so I had lots of capital market experience, listed M&A experience and so forth. So that was also super interesting. Um, and then you asked me about the transition. So, I mean, after having done games and I've seen so much, like it's really global business. It's a phenomenal business. You do this all around the world. Um, customers, several hundred million customers all around the world. Um, I thought like after 15 years, roughly, um, super successful, I've seen a lot. Let's try something else. Let's do something else with more impact uh, and so forth. And that's uh, where kind of the, the roots of going into something else and then merging out, out of uh, the current business and then uh, a thought process was started kind of. And uh, yeah, basically then uh, a couple of years later, we found an impossible cloud. Got it. Got it. And... Maybe let's talk a bit about the opportunity that you see in the cloud storage market. Um, 
there's, pre, I mean, there's pre, kind of projections all over the place of, of what this market's going to be in, you know, five, 10, 15 years. Uh, but I think it's fair to say that this is going to be a, a pretty big pie uh, that, I mean, it already is a big pie, but it's going to get bigger. Uh, and it's dominated by a few large players. And uh, it, it frankly feels like an, an industry that needs to be disrupted a bit. So maybe uh, just tell us a bit from your vantage point, like, why did you choose cloud storage as the next as your next venture? And like, what do you see as the opportunity here? Um, I, I think I want to go back just one second. Sure. Uh, this dates back a little bit uh, again to my experience doing the gaming company uh, um, uh, company, uh, gaming sites. Um, basically, we had a lot of contact to uh, the big tech players in the Valley back in the day. So especially Google and Facebook, we have been very close to. I met Mark Zuckerberg before. I also had the great chance uh, to, to talk to the uh, former CTO of Facebook. He was discussing with me like how they build data centers in North Sweden and how they optimize all that kind of stuff because uh, they really build everything at massive scale. Uh, Google, same thing, like lots of VP level meetings, so forth in, in Mountain View. And so that was really influential. I would say um, the network that we have built for the gaming company was already pretty massive. It was like thousands of servers all around the world, uh, millions of concurrent users, all this low latency all around the world, what you need. But these companies built everything at uh, at least two orders of magnitude larger. And um, I always was thinking uh, this cannot be the future, like, I don't know, five, six, seven companies, although I, I admired in a way like what they're doing, but like five, six companies kind of owning the whole internet, like being able to shut everything down in, in like one second, uh, uh, whatever, like pressing a button or so. So I thought always, okay, is there a way like to, to disrupt this, uh, this system somehow or build something, uh, build something else. And of course, um, then the whole storage area um, is like, it's a huge market. Um, so the whole cloud market actually uh, captured my mind. I mean, I've been into this like uh, from a customer perspective uh, for a long time. And I thought, okay, the future might look different. Um, we need uh, exponentially growing networks, uh, also exponentially growing decentral, like way more decentral networks. Um, it's just like first principle thinking, uh, like there's a lot of use cases that we need um, uh, huge more uh, demand uh, capable for like serving for uh, in the near term future. AI is changing the whole thing or accelerating the whole thing even more. Um, so the whole AI inference that's going to uh, going to come and so forth. So the landscape is changing there. It's a huge wave. It's a huge opportunity. It's a trillion dollar market. Everybody is moving into that space. And I was thinking like. With the experience that we have collected, is there a way uh, to, to, to enter this market and potentially uh, offer something more decentral, which is needed anyways, um, and a way of like building this next generation of the Internet? And then, obviously, I stumbled upon like first time probably 2015, 16, but then really thinking about this 2018, I would say uh, Web3. And I think the superpower of incentivizing a lot of people, uh, partial ownership, millions of people who are contributing to the same thing. And then essentially with a combined power of so many people, ultimately you might be able to like dethrone uh, the, the largest companies on earth. That's super interesting. So you've kind of, you're, you're kind of looking at it like three different ways, right? For on the first hand, you were, operating a business that that used these services right so you 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 kind of saw the inside of how this all worked like you knew the folks at facebook at google and you know, at a high level and then um then obviously you've you've you kind of stumbled across web3 and this whole idea of decentralization and and you kind of you know, seeing like oh, how, could, how could this be applied to like the cloud storage uh market or like the, the market for 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 compute and cloud and whatnot and um and I, i've always kind of found it interesting how you know, when I, when I, when I joined Filecoin a couple of years ago with Filecoin Foundation, like I, I started doing some research on just the history of storage, right? Like how, you know, it's not something I really teach in schools in America, but you know, it is pretty interesting to learn about, but you know, back in, to go back to the fifties, like these IBM, like little punch cards and things. And then you had these, you know, like ma magnetic tapes. And then, you know, starting in the two thousands, you had kind of the cloud storage revolution where there's AWS and Google and all these things. But then over the last 20 years or so, you really haven't had any um, I don't want to say there hasn't been any innovation because there obviously has been, but like there hasn't been the kind of like paradigm shifting new thing in, in 
this particular market, right? There's, you know, AWS and Google Cloud and Azure, they're all, you know, improving and doing different things and whatnot. But there hasn't really been like this new fundamentally like novel idea. And, and I feel like that's kind of what like what when I looked at like Filecoin, I looked at what like you guys are doing with a possible cloud. I'm like, okay, I feel like this idea of kind of harnessing the, you know, the decentralized swarm in the ecosystem is essentially how you can take on these kind of big tech players. Uh, whereas a single startup by themselves couldn't just go and take out, you know, Google or Amazon or something. But like, if you have kind of this decentralized swarm, uh, that's where the, that's where like the, the paradigm shift is going to come from. Um, anyway, not really a question there, but I would love your re your reaction to that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, starting with the first or the, the last statement from you, like uh, you need the swarm actually to, to tackle the big ones. Um, I mean, just to put this into numbers, uh, Google and Microsoft alone, they are each spending roughly between 30 to 50 billion annually uh, into the infrastructure. Right. So I think there is no way for any single company, any startup or whatever to tackle this, right, to raise enough money to really build um, anything competitive to their networks. No way. But on the other hand, if you look into what Web3 has already done, it's creating tremendous amounts of hardware networks, basically. Uh, worth billions and trillions of dollars. So, I mean, obviously, Bitcoin being the largest network, I mean, consuming a lot of power, nobody really knows, like, uh, how many, um, uh, yeah, where is that going to grow? But if you look into, like, in terms of compute power and so forth, this is way, way more massive than the whole Amazon and, and, and Google network. And it's done by the crowd, basically. And then you have Ethereum. You have also lots of deep hints. Like Filecoin is massive too, right? So it's it's phenomenal. It's like something that you could not gather as a single company. So I think that's, first of all, it's one of the modes that the, the big tech players relied on. Basically, if we outspend any competition, nobody can win against us, right? But this is not no longer true with uh, the superpower of Web3. So you just need uh, to build... Uh, uh, some kind of network that is going into the direction of potentially tackling also from the use case, tackling the, these guys. And then from the hardware perspective, I think you can do it, right? And Web3 has shown this. So I think this is what was so amazing to me um, that finally, ultimately, there is a way of tackling this. And then maybe in terms of like what you mentioned, like evolutionary, um, there is a lot of evolution happen happening right now. And also, I think there is a lot more evolution uh, just in front of us, uh, front of us that has to happen. Um, so, if you think about storage, I mean, we started with storage, um, but obviously, um, we are not called like Impossible Cloud Storage. We call ourselves Impossible Cloud Network because we want to build like a holistic cloud service. We cannot build this all, all on our own. We will not build all the services on our own. We basically want to build an ecosystem where. On the one hand, you have the hardware providers who provide hardware to the network. This can be tier two, tier three data centers providing hard drives, memory, network, uh, compute, GPU, CPU, compute, and so forth. And then on the other hand of the protocol, on the other side of the protocol, we want to have service providers, um, Web2 companies that bundle uh, services or build services, software services on top of this hardware and offer this to enterprise customers. So this is the idea. Um, and a lot of this evolutionary thing is, is needed there. Um, the reason why we started with object storage um, is basically you have this, what's called like this data gravity. Um, and data gravity meaning, uh, or data locality meaning, that wherever the data is, it makes a lot of sense from a physical perspective, from an economical perspective, to, to compute the data where the data is being generated, right? So rather move the compute code to the data than the other way around. And um, this is becoming tremendously more uh, important in the future, uh, as you can imagine, like it, like an incredible amount of uh, uh, data being generated somewhere on the edge. And it doesn't just does not make sense to move all this data all the time to a central data center hub and then compute it there and then move it back to the end customer. So like the early days CDNs and so forth, you will need much, much more decentralized infrastructure 
especially for all these AI inference use cases and so forth um, that are just about to come. So the networks that we will need in the future will definitely have to look much more decentral than like what Amazon is providing right now. So let's talk a bit more about uh, what you guys are proposing to do or what you what you are building. Uh, you have kind of this, you, you hinted at it before with the kind of the, the three layers where there's the, the hardware providers, service providers, and the verification uh, layer. Uh, maybe let's dive in a bit more into like, how do you how, how do you break out these layers? And then w- what exactly is each layer responsible for? Yeah, so I touched on this already a little bit, but um, let's take this in like in, in steps. So the hardware providers basically provide the hardware. Um, and this is like a lot of... Um, professional, semi-professional data centers. So we're not talking so much about con- end consumer hardware because with end consumer, like like you or my laptop or whatever, it's tremendously hard to build any kind of enterprise grade service. So what we are looking for more is uh, for is um, data centers, tier two data centers, tier three data centers and professionals that operate out of these data centers who have the, the right compliance, uh, who have um, the, the speed and the enterprise grade hardware. And there is a lot of excess capacity out there. So we checked with several hundred data centers. There are thousands of data centers all around the world. And lots of these data centers are getting squeezed right now by the largest cloud offerings and and and, and like the Amazons and Googles of the world, right? And they are happy to, to collaborate and offer excess hardware to a network. Um, and this is one side of the protocol. So basically, programmatically, they can connect to the protocol and then get rewarded with a token. Uh, it's a very similar model to like what Filecoin and many others have established already uh, with uh, staking and collateral. And um, if they misbehave or if they are working like too slow or whatever, there might be some slashing of the collateral and so forth. So a, a pretty pretty much established um, uh, business uh, on that side. On the other side, you have uh, service providers. Uh, And I think this is also tremendously important. If you think about the AWS stack um, or some other stacks like uh, Microsoft Azure or GCP or so, there is like on AWS alone, I think it's like 200 different services that they offer, right? From any kind of uh, databases and CDN systems and uh, really a lot of stuff uh, that they offer. And again, like as I said, on the hardware side, also on the software side, no single startup will be able uh, to program that all by, by themselves, right? So that's the reason why we said, okay, um, we want to open the system in a way that professional companies uh, can become service providers and then um, uh, acquire resources also for tokens through the protocol, hardware resources, um, deploy their software on top of this, and then offer the software to regular enterprise customers. And the first service provider, it's actually the uh, the German entity, Impossible Cloud GmbH, that we founded. Um, and that's, I think, one of the very few companies that I know that is operating with web free technology that is really having uh, a lot of traction already on the enterprise customer world. So basically, our idea was from the beginning, uh, we want to bring mass adoption to web free technology. And basically, you need an enterprise grade product uh, that is compliant, secure, fast and so forth. And this is what we started with, and uh, and and this is what Impossible Cloud GmbH like, is doing right now. This 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 entity, and there will be many other uh, service providers. I think one of the next uh, uh, service that will be offered is probably something in the uh, GPU AI area, um, and then there is some other stuff that's uh, that's about to come. Probably not 250 services in the near term <laughs> future, but uh, it's it's a long way to go. Yeah, well, that's a good point that that you have to be able to have these services on top of the storage to really create that stickiness for the for the end user, right? Because the end user is going to. I mean, that's something we think a lot about in Filecoin land is like, how can this be something that is indeed competitive uh, with with existing Web two offerings? Like, what what to what level do we have to reach before this actually becomes like a, a you know a fully competitive, if not better, product? And not just on price, but on also on functionality, right? It's like you have to have these different offerings, right? But but I like what 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 your approach is, uh, and you spell this out quite nicely in your in, in the the white paper that you guys published recently, which is really 
you're like, it's, no startup is going to build all these things on their own, right? Like you have to be able to have a certain level of composability and customizability where, you know, if I'm, if I'm the service provider, like you can't, I can't be the person who's, you know, I can't be the company that's relying on, I can't be building up my own, my own hardware stack. Like I have to be relying on somebody else's hardware essentially uh, that this network provides. And then I'm able to kind of create like a customized service offering based on uh, some of the hardware uh, that's available through the network. And I offer that to my clients and like, and I, and I feel like that level of kind of composability and, uh, and just kind of customizability. Um, I feel like that makes that, that makes the job a little easier for each individual, but then it also kind of, it also, um, it creates more of like a, it creates more of like a flywheel effect, I guess. Um, I mean, is that kind of like the vibe you're going for here where it's like, you know, the more, you know, everyone kind of comes in and they have their own specialty and then all of a sudden, uh, the, the a variety of you can you can hit that 200 services offered you know much more quickly if people are kind of pooling the resources together essentially absolutely absolutely so it's a little bit like uh, Lego Lego building uh, bricks or Lego building blocks or so and um, yeah the flywheel for sure I mean in the end we want to build um, a protocol um, where you have many network participants that all contribute to the same goal. Uh, delivering a holistic cloud offering, right? And uh, I think that's that's the ultimate goal. So um, I'm always, um, I was always, always thinking, like if I think about the market, um, in one dimension, I'm always thinking about like, there are single service offerings and then multi-service offerings in the Web2 world, like single service offerings, like just object storage or like a Dropbox or like a Fasabi, Backblaze, like object storage services or whatever. And then you have these holistic cloud offerings from an AWS where you can get any kind of service. And then if you uh, think about the Web3 world and how the Web3 world is developing, I think the Web3 world um, ultimately started uh, more with one service, which I think is good because if you don't focus, if you try to do everything at the same time, it's not going to work. So there are a lot of uh, pioneers like Filecoin or like if you think about Compute, like Akash and, and many others. And um, so I think they, they started off with uh, single services. I think the end goal is to, to make these services enterprise grade and combine them in the way that a customer can use multi of these services. Because the, cus the customer ultimately, they don't just want to back up data. They want to uh, save the data, primary workloads, and then run any kind of analytics, computational job, or whatever on top of this, right? And then combine this in, in many crazy different ways or serve this to customers and so forth. So that's that's what where the ultimate customer demand lies. So the ultimate goal is really to build a holistic, decentral cloud offering. And um, this is only going to happen if you are able uh, to connect many service providers or deepen projects into the system. And I think also Filecon is super interesting. I mean, first of all, what Filecon always, I think, did great, and uh, we are part of this. I mean, Filecon is an investor in us, and we have a very good relationship there. So this Filecoin ecosystem, uh, the Protocol Lab, uh, Labs network, where lots of companies and people collaborate. So I think that's a great, super great approach. At the same time, I think uh, in terms of offering, um, the Filecoin service in terms of a, a Glacier type of uh, archival backup, I think it's a, it's a great approach, right? So I think there are also their ways of potentially collaborating and, and um, that's our idea down the line. I think in order to make this happen, you need a lot of backward compatibility, interoperability. You need to build the right interfaces so that um, these things can kind of plug in together. Um, and this is what we are working on, right? So first we wanted to demonstrate um, the first single vertical slice object storage all the way from enterprise customers that we have right now with all the channel partners. It's a super difficult ecosystem there out there in the, in the Web2 world. Lots of integrations that we have already, uh, lots of enterprise software that's integrated in our product. And then all this vertical slice down the way through the protocol to the hardware providers running on uh, on, on external nodes. Um, this is what we have done now. Uh, super excited to, to uh, launch the token in the next few months or so. Um, and then from there on, like branching out uh, to more different services and offerings uh, and offering this to, to end customers. I think that's that's the path forward. Amazing. 
Could you tell us a bit more about the role of the token in the network? You, you, you alluded to it earlier, but maybe if you could spell that out a bit more, uh, more in depth, like how does, how does the token work to kind of keep this flywheel moving essentially? Yeah, so I think there are, um, there are a lot of um, um, aspects of the token that are pretty known to the Web3 world um, already. Like what I mentioned before, um, paying uh, or rewarding hardware providers um, for participating in the network. So essentially, the, the, the token is really a utility in order to participate on the network from the service provider side and as well as from the hardware provider side. I think that's super important. Um, at the same time, you can secure the network uh, through an economical approach like with collateral and so forth. Um, I don't think we have the time to dive into this into deep, Like, but uh, all these approaches have this so-called deep in verification problem, like wherever a third party runs the hardware, you need to somehow ensure that they don't tamper with the hardware. And if they do, you need to somehow slash some kind of collateral or make this economically unattractive. So I think also for that perspective, a token is super useful. Um, and then I think in the end, ultimately, the token is just a facilitator um, of, of joint participation in that network. So you can um, incentivize other participants in the network, like service providers, developers, um, also uh, the hardware providers. And also, like jointly, um, we have some, some uh, thoughts that we engineer right now where you can, for example, uh, delegate some staking, for example, um, ultimately, also making it easier for some hardware providers not to, to run the full investment uh, uh, in the hardware themselves, but also through the token. So I think there are a lot of ideas. And um, this is not too unfamiliar for me uh, because like the gaming industry, like the free-to-play industry, is not too far away from a lot of these ideas, right? So in a free-to-play industry, like these in-game economies uh, where you have inflation, deflation, price elasticity, all that kind of stuff, um, all the difficulties that you have in a uh, token tokenomics environment as well that need to be modeled in the right way, uh, that you don't have any upward but also downward death spirals and all that kind of stuff. So I think in the details, there's a lot of work to be done. Um, and right now, this is, uh, this is going super interesting. Maybe one last sentence on the validator nodes because you, you asked me before. Um, so the first thing where the token comes into play is now in a validator node offering uh, that we will do in the next uh, probably two months or so, where people are able to, to buy NFT licenses, and then these licenses uh, are uh, entitling you to operate a, a validator node. And if you run this validator node for the work that you do, you get rewarded with a token. Got it, got it. Uh, no, thank you for that. And then maybe piggybacking off that last point, uh, I'd love to touch on just your roadmap and maybe talk a bit about where you are right now on the roadmap and, and what should we be expecting to see in maybe the next six, 12 months? Yeah, sure. So the main focus right now is really on the Web3 side, uh, get the protocol uh, out the door, um, get the, the, the token to work. And uh, so this is what we focus on fully now. Um, just in terms of history, to put this in perspective, uh, the first two years of a possible cloud, we were solely focusing on building the Web2 product uh, because building an enterprise-grade Web2 product, I think it's very often completely underestimated. Um, I mean, I know from a competitor company, they are just like a Web2 company. They needed alone like 20 million uh, just to like uh, build the first MVP in object storage. And they are quite successful right now. And um, so that's around the ballpark what we raised as well as in, in capital. So that's the first two years. And then starting this year, uh, we just started to dive into the free side. We onboarded hardware providers. We are in the onboarding phase of uh, more hardware providers are onboarding right now and looking for hardware providers all around the world. So um, uh, good discussions there. Um, also in the US, mainly we have some uh, sites now in Europe. Uh, we will branch this out also to Asia. And um, then like in two months or so, we will have this node offering where people can buy these NFTs um, and then are able to like operate these validator nodes. And then shortly after, we will list the token on an exchange. And that, that I think, is like the, the main inflection point. From that point on, um, the validator nodes can start their work. Um, a lot of the hardware providers that we have onboarded on a, on a, 
on an agreement, a token post token agreement uh, will then uh, start their work as well. And I think that's what the, the point in time where the network will grow exponentially. Um, and then at the same time, you can ramp up the customers. So there's a lot of uh, market access tooling and so forth where uh, that we can also then offer for other service providers, other deep end projects that uh, can plug into the system and then offer their services on our platform uh, to, to, or on top of the protocol. Um, to, to end customers and create more and more demand. And I think the demand creating is the key um, that Web3 needs to deliver now anyways, or with us or without us, it uh, doesn't matter. But I think the demand side is really crucial right now to get this out of the door and make this mass market. Yeah, it's a great point. We, we've, we've proven that we can we can amass the hardware and the supply and everything. Um, but but the, the the question now is, is how do we get the demand there? Right. I think that's been the kind of the, the thorn in the side of maybe some of these cloud deep in projects. Um, uh, but, you know, we're getting there. Right. But you got to it's like a chicken and egg problem. Right. Like you need the, 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 the hardware and the capacity before you can before you can like handle the demand. Right. Uh, maybe uh, just one last question here. Um, what types of, uh, you mentioned that there is a possibility for like other types of, you know, kind of deep in networks to kind of partner with you or offer services on top of the network. Um, can you maybe just spell out quickly, like what that would look like, or like what, what other types of, of projects would be like good partners for this? Yeah, so at the moment what we do, like from a legal perspective, so this is probably the lawyer talking in me, but uh, you see this is needed sometimes. So we are uh, spinning this off the whole protocol and everything into like a, a completely independent Swiss foundation. And this foundation is supposed to like be, a, be the, 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 the guide of like making this protocol successful all around the world. And through that, we will look for other deep-end projects. Actually, we are starting to look for partners right now already um, who will offer uh, different types of services. Let's say, for example, there is a, a Falcon type, or like Falcon, whatever, offering a Glacier type of service. Or let's say, for example, there is uh, other companies who offer uh, GPU computational services, right? And for all of them, I think what's super interesting is uh, to make their offering uh, open for end customers, right? So, and I think we have a smart way of how they can integrate into the protocol um, and then also mutually benefit, like usually most of these projects have their own token. So we need to find a way, and we have some good ideas on how to do this. Uh, we need to find a way where their token economy is is uh, it's, it's it's appreciating uh, as as our, as our token is appreciating as well in value, and what we can offer, of course, is uh, then access to to end customers and demand. And we have a lot of end customers that store data already uh, through the nodes that we run, and of course there is a high request and demand of running additional services on top of this. Right, either it might be at an even cheaper price to have like, I don't know, long archival storage, or it might be you want to have uh, some computation on top of the data. So I think there is uh, there's a lot of requests and demand. Um, I think we just need to take this in steps and really decide on like step by step, uh, what are the right uh, next deep end and source providers that we want to uh, onboard into the system. I think ultimately in the long run, probably the, we can, open up the protocol more to a, to a trustless uh, thing. But I think in the beginning, it will be probably more step-by-step uh, -step, uh, partnerships uh, and integrations, uh, and, and then we can let it go. Got it, got it. Well, hey, Kai, we're out of time now, but really appreciate you coming on the show. Uh, this has been super interesting learning about what you guys are building with Impossible Cloud Network. Uh, very exciting work. Uh, wishing you all the best of success in the next uh, the coming months here. Sounds like you have a lot on the roadmap. Uh, a lot on your plate. So really appreciate you taking the time to uh, to come and talk to us and tell us about the project. Uh, I'd like to turn it back to you for any final thoughts and how can folks get in touch or uh, where should they go if they want to learn more? Yeah, sure. Th thanks, Aaron, for having me. And uh, anybody who wants to get informed, like uh, follow us on X or follow us on, on, on Discord. There's all the latest news, especially also about the node offering, which I think is the most exciting part. Now, being part of this before the, the listing of the token. Um, and uh, yeah, just uh, keep in touch uh, or reach out to me. Uh, I'm also on, on, on X or uh, old school LinkedIn, uh, whatever you prefer. Amazing. 
Well, Kai, thank you so much for your time today. And thanks to everyone for watching or listening. And we will see you next time on DWeb Decoded. Thanks, Aaron. Take care.